to you and good morning to all of the viewers. So much to talk about, yet so little time. Uh, we're looking at today a positivity rate of 20%, which might seem encouraging because the number is reducing. But this morning, officially, we're reporting 516 deaths in the last 24-hour reporting period. And as we look at uh, the live or real-time figures coming in, that number is at 633. How do we juxtapose one uh, against the other? So we know that uh, the number of deaths will lag the number of cases slightly. And what we are going through right now in South Africa is the second peak of our third wave. Now, we are fortunate in our first two waves, we had a single peak. In other words, the cases rose and then they just went down. In this particular peak, because it's being driven by the Delta variant, which spreads in a very different way and much faster in close contact, we ended up with a situation where the epidemic in Gauteng ran quite far in advance of where the epidemic was in the coastal provinces. So the coastal provinces, uh, the Western Cape, Eastern Cape and Kozun Natal are now driving the second peak and the numbers are now starting to go back up and we're seeing that over the last several days the numbers have consistently been going up and we expect that that will continue for another few days before it hits its peak driven largely by KwaZulu Natal before it starts coming down. While we're going through that peak the number of deaths are going to go up and so we can expect a lot higher numbers of deaths over the next few days. It is said that the Delta variant has rendered everyone, including scientists, unable to conclusively give uh, predictions about uh, the, uh, the movement of these variants and COVID-19. Is this the case? So we knew right from uh, December last year that when we described the first variants, and in South Africa we described a completely new variant called, we called it at that time 501YV2, and nowadays it's given a much simpler name called the beta variant. We knew that the game had changed, that it was no longer going to be simply a matter that we just vaccinate everybody and that, you know, we can go back to normal. That's not going to be the case. Vaccinations play a critically important role because they provide personal protection against severe disease and death, but they also have a population benefit. Now, the problem with the Delta variant is that because it's able to escape some of the immunity, people who were previously vaccinated can become infected to a slightly greater extent. Now, some of the studies suggest you know, that uh, there are significant breakthrough infections. In other studies, the breakthrough infections have been uh, a very small number. Now, whatever the true number is, let's, for example, say that, you know, the breakthrough infections are one out of four. We still have a situation where the vaccines are preventing about three out of four clinical infections. Now, we knew that was going to be the case, and we knew that we're going to play this, this game with the virus, that we make vaccines, the virus is going to try to escape those vaccines. And then we're going to have to make a better vaccine. And so that's what we're going to see, a new generation of vaccines that can deal with a variant like the Delta variant. And so we'll, we'll continue doing this. I think it's the, perhaps the most important issue is that the virus is going to continue to mutate. But it can't mutate you know, at infinity. It's going to have to stop mutating at mm -hmm. some point where it is no longer gaining, you know, big advantage. Now, we don't know when that's going to happen. And so that's why predictions are difficult. But we can expect that we will see a few more variants. And that means that it's unpredictable. What we do know is that when we've had a wave, we tend to have about a three month gap, somewhere between 90 and 100 days. And that's when the next wave will pick up. So if that, if that gap remains consistent, and we don't know if it would, but if it does, we can expect we'll have a fourth wave sometime uh, in December.
Prof, let's talk some more about that escaping immunity that you're talking about. Uh, of course, our focus today is vaccine hesitancy, and I want to just find out if this is one of the conversations that's fueling this hesitancy. Uh, one of the nations that have been mostly affected uh, by coronavirus, the United States, already talking about a 20 September date of uh, uh, providing booster vac vaccinations for its uh, for its populations. Could this could could these kind of conversations be contributing to South Africans feeling that they just want to sit this one out and watch what's happening? So that would be very ill-advised because there's a significant personal benefit to vaccines. So everybody should get vaccinated, even if it's just for their own personal benefit. In other words, that they, by taking a vaccine, they are reducing the chance that they will need to go to hospital if they get infected. So from that point of view, you should take the vaccines. And all of the variants uh, the vaccines have remained effective against all of the four variants of concern, including the Delta variant, for severe disease. What's at issue is that we are seeing a change over time. And that change is that the variants are changing, but also people in the U.S. and Israel were vaccinated back in January. And they are not sure whether they are getting breakthrough infections now because the immunity is low or whether they're getting breakthrough infections now because the Delta virus has a much higher amount of virus. Now, what do I mean by that? Let me just explain that. The infectious dose, the amount of virus a person who's getting infected comes across in the previous uh, variants was at a certain level. With the Delta variant, because it's able to uh, infect cells so much more easily, what happens is that you get a very high amount of virus. So the amount of virus in your nose and throat is over a thousand times higher. That means that when I'm speaking or when somebody coughs, the amount of virus that they're putting out is a lot higher. So people have a higher chance of getting infected because the virus has so much more particles in the little droplets. So we are trying to understand all of that. Why are we trying to understand that? Countries that have an excess of vaccine doses, they have a lot, they've got millions of doses sitting in warehouses are looking at that and say, well, why don't we just give it to people, even though we don't know the real reason why they're getting breakthrough infections, you know, let's just give it to them. In my view, that's incorrect thinking. And in fact, is unethical because those vaccine doses would be much better used in giving people in poor countries, especially in Africa, their first doses before people in the US and Israel get their third doses. That for me is an unconscionable act. And I think that we've got to be very clear uh, about the level of evidence for booster doses. Right now, that evidence is tenuous. And in the face of that kind of evidence, I would suggest that giving first doses to people is far more important. We have requested, graciously requested our viewers to contribute to this conversation. And if you allow me, I'm just going to uh, look at some of the thoughts they've brought through. Uh, and we can uh, uh, speak about those. Let's take a look at them. All right, we're not able to upload them at the moment, but we're just going to continue with our conversations. Experts are, uh, predicting, Prof, that uh, uh, COVID-19 is going to be endemic, uh, developing, as a, developing a seasonal pattern. Uh, are you also, is your data also uh, directing you in this direction? I think we've got some precedents uh, in that there are four other coronaviruses that that cause you know very mild colds, and 
they come, you know, usually in the winter season, and they're quite seasonal. So, if this coronavirus follows that pattern, then it could become somewhat seasonal. I'm doubtful that it will actually follow in the same way. And the reason I'm doubtful is because across the world, we have seen the virus cause surges or cause waves, both in the summer and in the winter. And because of that, I'm less optimistic that it would be a once a year seasonal event. I suspect we will, we will continue to see outbreaks of this virus. For me, the critical issue is to take us over the next several years with a, a range of our tools, including vaccines, including our public health measures, to try and get to a point where the virus itself is no longer a public health threat. In other words, we will, you know, we'll still see outbreaks of the virus, but we won't be overly concerned about it because people won't get very ill from it. And when it does spread, it won't spread very far because most of the people are vaccinated. So I think we want to get to that point. When we're going to get to that point is not easy. And that's going to be our challenge. And our bigger concern is, are the next set of variants going to be even more problematic? Because our concern is that the Delta variant is spreading so fast, it's making, us, making it more difficult for us to achieve herd protection and us to achieve community level protection. But that's not a concern uh, that will last for very long because we're likely to make the next set of vaccines. And those next set of vaccines will deal with the Delta variant. We call it a heterologous boost. Now, those vaccines haven't been made yet, but that's the whole way in which we're going to deal with this virus. The virus will infect us, it'll create a new variant, we'll make a better vaccine for the new variant, and that's how we'll continue until we get to a point where the virus isn't able to make new variants. Professor uh, Karim, let's take a look at those tweets that have come through. In fact, the first one, I think, deals with that uh, uh, conversation we had earlier about the booster shots. It says, it's been said that the vaccinated people after six months, the protect, uh, after six months, the protection that of the vaccine wears off. Is there any truth to this? Let's take a look at another tweet that's Gordon Maswangani. Lechasa Patla saying, my cousin is on chronic medication. Is it safe to take vaccine while on chronic medication? All right, let's take a look at another one, Temba Tsuvoka, saying, Upshin to the crew and viewers, how long does the vaccine exist in my system after being vaccinated? So can the vaccinated people still be infected by COVID-19? If yes, then what does the vaccine do? I think, Temba, to some extent, we've answered that one, but I'll hear what the prof says. All right, uh, another tweet. All right, the, that's it for now. Uh, what your responses to those tweets? Okay, so let's deal with the first issue, which I've touched on, which is the issue of waning immunity. Now, there's a big concern across the world about whether the immunity you get from the vaccines remains available to deal with the virus over a long period. And the reason why we don't know that answer is we've only been vaccinating people since December last year. So we've only got, you know, the last nine months of experience. But what we do know from past and other vaccines is that when you give a vaccine, you give a few doses to get a boost. And that boost leads to something called memory B cells. And those memory B cells, they sit in your lymph nodes. And when you encounter the virus, your body mobilizes those memory B cells and they quickly make antibodies to fight this virus. And so that's why when you've been vaccinated, you still can deal with the virus many years later. In fact, in elderly people, they showed that you could, they could had immunity against the original Spanish flu of 1918. So, you know, 80 years later, these individuals still had immunity that was effective against that flu virus. So immunity is 
often with you for life. Now the question is, how much of antibodies do you have to have on board? In other words, you can't wait for it to be made from the lymph nodes. And that's what's a big question in science. We don't know the answer to that. We don't know whether you need this level or that level or at what level is it needed. So as a precaution in countries where they vaccinated you know, six, eight months ago, they are giving booster doses because they're not sure. It's not because it's been shown that if you get a booster dose, it will protect you against the Delta variant. There's no evidence for that. But what we do know is that if you give a booster dose, you get a temporary boost in the amount of antibodies you have circulating in your blood. But that also wanes away. So within a matter of a few months, it goes back to the same situation. So it's not clear whether these boosters make any difference. But I can say that if you've been vaccinated, it doesn't matter which variant is circulating. The personal benefit, the benefit in terms of reducing severe disease and avoiding death is still present. And that is a very important benefit of these vaccines. Now, the second question that was asked was about chronic medication. What if you are taking medication for hypertension or diabetes or something else? The answer is that it, all of those individuals who are taking these kinds of medications, the vaccine has no adverse effect on those taking those medications. And people taking medications, no adverse effect. It is perfectly safe to go and take your vaccines. Now, the important thing is that if you have one of these diseases like diabetes and hypertension or cancer, uh, we call these comorbidities. If you have one of those comorbidities, you are at a higher risk of getting severe disease. So it's even more important that you get vaccinated. Make sure you go and get your, your J&J dose, your single dose, or your Pfizer dose, it doesn't matter. Both are pretty good. Go and get your vaccination, and that will help uh, reduce the risk that you will get severe disease. Uh, Prof, we have a, next, a tweet and it's related to this question that has kept coming up over and over again, where people are concerned mm -hmm. that because these new vaccines were rushed, uh, nobody is certain of the long-term effects of these vaccines and also why it's taken so quick to find a solution to COVID-19 when for argument's sake, uh, it's taken so many years to find solutions for HIV AIDS for argument's sake. And the tweet says, can you get a disease from vaccines uh, that uh, are supposed to it? And why do vaccines have live pathogens, but others have killed pathogens? Uh, that's a, uh, a very good question, but it's a very complicated science to explain. I'll just give you a short answer to that's it. That's why we have you here. Uh, more detail. <laughs> Oops, sorry. It's can okay, you, you can continue, Prof. Okay, so I'm going to give you a short answer. Just know that there's a longer answer some other time. Now, the short answer is that when we give somebody a vaccine, we are basically giving the part of that virus that will enable the body to develop an immune response. And when your body develops an immune response, it then has memory. And that memory and I told you earlier about memory B cells. We also have memory T cells. That memory will always remember when this same enemy comes the next time. You know, I've dealt with you before. I know how to deal with you. I'll kill you because I've got the, all of this armor ready to deal with it. So in order to expose people to the proteins of a virus, we can either give the actual protein, and there are many vaccines that are made like that, what are called protein subunits. We just give the proteins of the spike. There's no virus there. It's just the proteins of the spike. But sometimes 
you make vaccines where you just take the whole virus and you just kill it. And the spikes that are on the dead virus then stimulate an immune response. Now, you can't get the infection because the virus is dead. So that's called inactivated viral vaccines. And of course, now we have two new technologies, mRNA and viral vectors. Both of them give a, a slight, they, they, make the, they make the body make the proteins. It's a slightly different step that's involved. But from all of the vaccines, and I've been involved with vaccines for almost what, 40 years, uh, they are all uh, aimed to doing the same thing. They're aiming to give your body the experience of the proteins that matter in this virus so that you have memory for life. Now, all of these viruses, no matter what form they are, they are all shown to be quite effective. Some, some of them need two doses, some need one dose, and some need three doses even. But once you've had your doses, you've developed that immunity and that memory, which is what kicks in. So that's a short answer to quite a complicated question about how different types of vaccines work. I hope that was helpful. Prof, I know today we're talking about trying to encourage South Africans to go out and vaccinate. But let's just talk about people who've already uh, tested positive and are now living with what has come to be called long COVID. And uh, conversations now being held about coexisting with COVID. What conversations are being held here in terms of how people can cope with the after effects? So actually, that's quite an important point. And I'll just go back to one of the issues you raised earlier, which is, you know, how is it we were able to make this vaccine so quickly uh, against COVID, whereas we haven't made a vaccine against HIV in 40 years? And the answer to that is that these viruses are very different. HIV is a very different virus from COVID, from SARS-CoV-2. Now, if you take SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19, the disease, a human being, when infected with the virus, most of us will just clear the virus. We can conquer the virus. We clear it, we get rid of it, and our body is able to deal with it. So a vaccine against the coronavirus simply copies that. We copy what you can do naturally. And the reason we want to give you a vaccine instead of letting you get it naturally is because we don't want you to get sick, right? So that's why we're trying to give you the vaccine. Now in HIV, no one has ever cleared the virus. No one. It has never been done that a person can naturally clear this virus. So we've got nothing to copy in HIV. And we have no idea what immunity will protect you against an HIV infection because the virus integrates itself. So there are many reasons why we don't have a, virus, a vaccine for HIV, but we do have one for the coronavirus. And it should be pointed out, the work on the coronavirus, actually a vaccine, started many years ago, over 10 years ago. And the work started in the original SARS, the first SARS, SARS-CoV-1. And the vaccines that were developed for SARS-CoV-2 were based on the original work that was done some 18 odd years ago on SARS-CoV-1. So uh, one mustn't be confused about the speed with which science has moved if you don't know the whole history behind how these vaccines were made and the time it took. I think people have been saying, well, you did the clinical trials very quickly. And the answer to that is yes, the clinical trials were done quickly because they were concertina. In other words, we didn't know, you know, like we normally do, we do one after the other. They just put them all together and did them in a faster way. But at no stage was any of the scientific requirements compromised. Today's New England Journal of Medicine has an article that provides information from the long-term follow-up of uh, over 850,000 people in the US who've been vaccinated with the Pfizer vaccine, showing how safe this vaccine is one year later. So it's quite amazing that you've got vaccines where you've given so many millions, hundreds of millions of people doses, 
and you're seeing such a good safety profile. Now, there is no vaccine, there is no treatment that is completely side effect free. There is no such thing. If, if, the, if, the, if the medication you're taking has no side effects, then it's probably just placebo because all medications have some side effects. And when we look at the side effects of the vaccines that we have for COVID-19, those vaccines tend largely to be mild. They are arm pain, a bit of fever, a bit of headache, but they, after a day or two, they're all gone. We do see some severe side effects, but they're very rare, extremely rare. And when you look at the overall profile of the virus, uh, of the vaccines, they are extremely safe. But we pointed out that you compare that to actually getting the real infection. Imagine if you weren't vaccinated, if you said, oh, I'm not going to take the vaccine because I'm scared, you know, I, I might get side effects. Well, the real effects of the virus are far worse. Firstly, you have a much higher risk of getting severe side effects from the real infection, whether those effects are acute effects of severe disease where you need ICU care or whether it's about long COVID. Now, we, we don't fully understand long COVID. So what we do know is that it seems to be quite common and it doesn't matter whether you got an asymptomatic infection or whether you had severe infection. It seems that asymptomatically infected people with very mild disease still are at risk of long COVID. One of the main features of long COVID is that you get what they call brain fog. You know, you have difficulty in concentrating. You can't read. It's very difficult to focus on things. And it lasts for more than three months. And so that's what we generally are calling long COVID. Now, I would not wish long COVID on my worst enemy. It is a really difficult condition. And even if you're young and you worry, oh, I'm not going to get severe disease. Well, you could still get long COVID. So get vaccinated. And that's where we're going to end it. And I don't know if that convinces uh, hesitant South Africans that much, but the prof saying new data, they're saying that the vaccines have a good safety profile. Thank you so much for your time uh, this morning. Professor Salim Abdul Karim is a director at Caprisa, a clinical infectious diseases epidemiologist and a member of the African Task Force for Coronavirus. Let's take a quick break. We'll be back just now.